Oh yeah, welcome to episode 116 of the Permaculture Pimpcast. Yeah, I knew the, the new intro is probably throwing you for a loop, but hey, we got it back. I honestly forgot about it. <laughs> yeah, I forgot that we did that <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> I was like, oh crap, I messed up the music, and then I remembered... Wow. I forgot about that. I like it, man. I I, I really think the Gap Band kind of sets the mood for what's going on after that. Yeah. I I really, I really love it. I mean, I think it's early in the morning. If you listen to the words, there's a rooster, the whole nine yards. And I think people dig it. All right. So this is episode 116 of the Permaculture Pimp Cast. And as always, it's brought to you by Hickory Ridge Soap. From two old crows homestead.com. Turn that simp into a pimp. Bang yum. Also, Heaven's Harvest, y'all, 10% off with promo code PERMA. Remember, all your storage, well, not storage needs, but your preparedness needs can be met over there. And they got everything. I mean, the seeds we got, bam, batting a thousand. All the other stuff they have over there, if you can't get it in dry goods, you might want to look over there. If you don't have a freeze dryer, you might want to check that out. Were those cucumbers mom just harvested uh, from there? I believe it was. Well, they're pickles now. Yeah. Well, they're... And cucumber salad. A bunch of... Di- oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, this time of year, you're having a whole big bumper crop of a lot of things that maybe you have too many of. We'll cover that here in a minute. But if you'd like to tip a pimp, go check us out on the Fountain app. You can listen to all your pimp cat. Oh, excuse me, everybody else's <laughs> podcasts yeah, over there. It's the only pimp. Yeah, cast. I'm real. I'm really, really happy with the format we got in this show because we've changed things up a little bit and we're bringing in some friends. Some you haven't heard from really that much. You well, one of them you've heard one time before, one you've heard several times before, and one you hear all the time. Yep. So. I'm really, really excited about how we got this structured now. So let us know if you like it. Go ahead and reach out and uh, feel free to give us a five star rating on anywhere you're listening to this pimp cast right now. So, with that said, we're going to jump right into the farm news, which right off the bat, oh, uh, shoot, it's been raining. And okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, let's, so let's just talk about the rain for a minute, second, for, for a second, son. Okay. Specifically, what I'm getting at is. On my phone app, there was like a barely a chance of rain. And on, it's rained from 5 o'clock this morning till present moment. On my phone app, or weather app on my phone, it said 70% basically all day. And then Emily, my wife, who's sitting right next to me, is looking at her weather app. And it's saying 100% for sure all day. And then every single day, it's like they they know we're right next to each other and they're messing with us. Because every single day, it would be one degree off between her phone and my phone. Yeah, they're, they're definitely playing games here. I mean, we've talked about that a number of times. But hey, it is raining. And it's not necessarily a bad thing because it had been just a little bit. Now, at this altitude... When you get rain, this is why it's so important to capture, deflect, and amplify all power sources because check it out. When the rain goes away, we live in a higher altitude. So that means is that you have less humidity, which means all your evaporation is going to happen pretty doggone quick. So if you're not using mulch out there, if you're not capturing your water, you're thinking, oh, well, shoot, you live in a rainforest. Well, hey, um... When you the higher altitude you go, the thinner that air, the less the moisture, which is all the more reason why people I think become lazy in capturing their water. Well, yeah, I've had to brush up on like water catchment uh, just techniques recently because of that planning a trip out west to the desert for a consultation um, for consultations, I guess. Um, I've been having to brush up on all these water harvesting techniques and just uh, like one thing I think people forget about are those dew traps. You remember yeah. those? Oh, yeah. I, I remember learning about it in my permaculture design course, and then it was never brought up again. And then not, not, it wasn't the fault of the design course at all. It was just, I haven't seen it been brought up at all. No, I didn't seem like a whole lot of people are using it. Um, yeah, but that's the beauty of permaculture is that you can, and you've often said, uh, maybe right here on the podcast as well, that it is a list of tools. Yeah. So it enables you, no matter the environment, to know, okay, well, does a does a rain trap work here? No or yes. You could almost do it like a dichotomous key mm-hmm. where you could ask yes or no questions regarding uh, the area you're in or the method you want to use, and you can ask yes or no, okay, does a swale work here? No. 
Okay, what does? Uh, maybe key line. Well, does a swale work here? But like, just because it works, there might be other factors involved that that makes it not preferable. Yeah, but that's the beauty of this sublime design science yeah. is knowing which dog to take to the hunt as long, and I got to put an emphasis on this, as long as you're not in love with a certain technique. Right. Yeah. And how many times have you seen that? All the time. I mean, yeah. All the time, there's there's people who think, like uh, for key line example, like an example for key line. The people who study, who have studied key line design and have only studied that and haven't like do- dove into or dove into permaculture at all, they think key line is the answer to everything. Right. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with key line. On large scale pastures, it seems like largely that's the way to go versus versus a large uh, scale swale system, depending on the scenario. But like a two acre homestead, does key line really make sense? Does it? Well, that's the thing is that everybody falls in love. Like Mark Shepard is often talked about and folks that don't know Mark Shepard wrote restoration agriculture, a must read for anybody in this space. Anyway, he talked about, and I think this is part of why he doesn't get invited to some certain podcasts. And I think it has to do with, he's very direct, which I like, and he's to the point, which I like. And he's often critical about certain design methods where everybody was into a cob oven. Yeah. And then you're doing a cob oven in a place like this. Yeah. (laughs) And it's not covered and it winds up to a pile of mush. And then you blame permaculture because you took the wrong dog to the hunt. So that's what we're really getting at to here. Okay. So other things going on in the farm is I'm out here. I was planning two days now to put down the next. Hey dad, the, the rain, you didn't finish that aspect. That giant tree just, just fell down. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, there, there's this giant dead tree, like up, up the mountain behind the house that we haven't, uh, we just haven't cut it down yet. Cause it's a big dead tree. And then all this rain came in and then all of a sudden it fell down and it fell down in like the perfect spot. It could have landed on the house. It could have landed on cars, could have landed on us. Well, unless it, yeah. Well, if it, if, if well, it hit the house, it would have been, I don't know. It, it would have thrown a branch into the house. Right, I think. Right. It would have done some sort of damage, Yeah. but it, thank the Lord. I mean, that's the good Lord looking after us once again. Drop that thing in exactly the place. If I were dropping it, that's where I would have put it. Yeah, we couldn't have picked a better place for that thing to drop. And this thing was dead standing, but we didn't even know it when we got here because it was covered. We had brush all the way. We had zone five, literally five feet from the house at one point. And this tree, we didn't even see it. And then after we cut everything around it, it's like, okay, now what do we do with it? So problem solves itself, which is great because it's exactly... The thing I wanted to bring down. So. Hey, but y'all don't count on that happening. <laughs> no, no, that's like one in a million, man. That could have been bad. It could have hit a car. Could have hit. I mean, I, it wasn't long ago I had the sheep up there. Yeah. So it, there's a number of ways that thing could have gone bad. But you know, thank the good Lord once again. Um, stay on your knees, y'all. So talking about an extract, I'm working on doing a number of things as far as extracts and teas and stuff like that. And it's like, good night, man. And I know everybody can relate to this. It's like every single thing gets in your way. Okay, so I'm going to go out here and do this, but this pops up. I'm going to go out here and do this. And I got everything planned for it. Got the tubs filled up, got everything going. And then all of a sudden the pump I bought through the mail, missing parts. Yeah, That ain't going to work. And then it's one thing after another, one thing after another. And then it turns out this unexpected rain, at least on my phone, because honestly, with some of these areas, it's better if it is saturated with rain first. So now I can yeah. get after this tomorrow when there's going to be a little bit of cloud cover. I mean, this is <laughs> Let me it. check yeah. the weather. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and check it. <laughs> we'll check it in the morning and see what happens. Okay. Yeah, okay. Let's keep a record of it. Tomorrow, the forecast, 0% change of rain, high of 81. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. On my phone, it was saying something very different. So we'll see. We'll see. Now, is there any cloud cover? cloud cover yep yep so that's exactly what the doctor ordered so (laughs) what i'm going to do is i'm taking a variation of a bunch of different dogs to the hunt on this and instead of just doing a straight up extract i'm doing what dr ingham talked about giving them a lunchbox and there's a couple of reasons i'm doing so check this out little method that i tried i had a pile down there that was a little bit anaerobic now 
what that means is generally you don't want to use it. But I had this right. great idea, like, huh, if it's anaerobic, that means I have low oxygen conditions. But now all of the other bacteria, the fungi, nematodes, protozoa, you name it, all of it was in really good numbers. But we had some bad guys in there. Yeah. So I said, you know what? Maybe if I make an extract out of it and stick it in that bubbler down there, I wonder, I just wonder if the bad guys can't survive in that environment. Well, that's exactly what happened. Oh, yeah. We went ahead and put it in there, used it. I made an extract out of it in a bucket. Then I dumped it in there, let the air go through it, and there was not one bad guy to be found. Wow. But if you're making a tea and you put foods in there, well, if you're not careful, they will reproduce the microorganisms because in a compost tea, you're basically reproducing the microorganisms preferably the good ones. Yeah. But if they reproduce faster than the oxygen can infuse into that, it's going to go anaerobic. So your bad guys are going to take over. Right. But if you wait until the last minute to put your food in there for your uh, fungus, which is typically what I'm feeding. I'm not worried about feeding bacteria. They can go find their own grub. Usually you got too many of them anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so it's the fungus I'm trying to send out there with a lunchbox. So this it's little the method. It's diversity with, bio, with uh, bacteria that most people are lacking. Right. Yeah. Right. So you got, yeah, just one bad kind of bacteria. Well, we got quite a few. And they're going out there. It's not the bacteria so much that are the problem. But we got lots of other things that like to eat the bacteria. So that's a really good thing. But anyway, that looks like it's starting to come around. So let me tell you what else is farm news. And, um... Man, I heard a podcast. I sent it off to Pastor Lon. I sent it off to uh, Chef Snow. And um, is it the one you sent me? Yeah, same one. I got some thoughts on that too. Well, I'm sitting here looking into some chelation therapy, and I'm not sure how much we. Can, I, I'm not sure how much I want to get into it right now because I'd like to get this doctor on the program. But in a nutshell, there's a lot of tests out there from various doctors showing that the ones who have been jabbed are not only jabbed, but we're seeing the same problem happening in people that haven't been jabbed. So some of the hypotheses out there consist of maybe it's the stuff they're dropping from the sky. Maybe it's the stuff in the food or on the food. Maybe it's the people you're coming in contact with that have been jabbed. Nobody really knows for sure. But this doctor, and I hope to try to get her on the show, but man, I don't understand a lot of these folks that are in this space. There is no way to get a hold of them. I'm Be like, well, that, yeah. how do you, I'm like half these people. I'm like, okay, do you have a way to contact you? I saw you on somebody else's show. But anyway, there's, there's a lot of suspicion out there, not only from her, but a number of others that some way, somehow those of us that haven't been jabbed are starting to get the effects from like those that have. So the comment I had was different perspective. It was mainly just based on one thing that she said, and it was that the, what was it? The human body is flawed in that it doesn't produce its own vitamin C. I think she misspoke. She okay. English is not her first language. No, I, by that I did it did it started a chain of thoughts in, in my head. Not like I wasn't focusing on that. I don't know if that's true or not. I have a feeling it doesn't. It's not true based on based on this. If okay, so all the study that we're doing in the, with the soil and all that stuff, if you have the proper conditions, none of this bad stuff happens. If right. you have proper and the main thing, it seems to be oxygen. Oxygen, yeah. Yeah. So if your body is properly oxygenated, if it's an aerobic state and not an anaerobic state, I wonder how much of this stuff is just flushed out. Like, okay, so we apply NPK to soils to provide food to the plants and all that stuff. But if we provide a proper environment, we don't have to apply any of that NPK crap. I wonder if that's the same thing with the human body. Like if we have the, if we eat a proper diet, if we have the proper like um, um, movement and stuff like that in our lives, I wonder if we just like if we don't need to take these vitamin supplements or these these other things. Well, that's that's definitely. But you got to be getting it from your food. That's a very good hypothesis, son. In fact, farmers has been says the same thing. In fact, he has an acronym called NORM, N-O-R-M, stands for Nutrigenate, Oxygenate, Rest, and Move. So hmm. if you do those four things, generally you can stay healthy, but we're having man-made toxins thrown in from the outside, whether it's dioxins, whether it's these poisons, whatever the case may be. And because of it, I was sitting here looking in the chelation therapy. Now she's saying, yeah, you need to kick up your... What I like about it is she ain't personally selling anything. Not that, not that there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. 
But I'm saying I, I have no problem whatsoever. In fact, I wish she was because now it's on my end to sit here and try to find what is a legitimate chelation therapy because we do have, and I'm not going to talk about it just yet, but we do have right under this roof people that have been damaged by certain things. I'm not going to go into that now until I know that I have a, a legit solution that's worked for us. But we've talked about some of the therapy we did in the last podcast and how your mom was the beneficiary of some of that. And she went a second time yesterday and she's feeling even better. <laughs> so we're going to keep on looking and we're going to let y'all know as much as we possibly can, but I am looking for some chelation therapy. Basically it's a way of getting all these heavy metals that basically they can't, their operating system, so to speak, cannot operate cannot operate if you pull out some of these key elements. Now, with that, it's going to pull out some of your beneficial minerals, so you better have a good program to get it back in. When the time comes, I'll definitely let you know how I'm going about doing it. All right, other farm news. All Keep- these all these $200,000 college degrees and this pimpin's for free. Bam! <laughs> That's how we roll. Okay, cucumbers out the wazoo. And check this out. Later on in the program, look, this is that time of year where there's certain crops where Matt and Gabby were by the other day from Farm (laughs) Forward Living. And we're like, hey, can y'all want some cucumbers? They're like, no, we need to offer you some cucumbers. I mean, just be really cognizant if you have limited space. Now, we don't out here, but if you do, do you really need five cucumber plants when they are highly prolific? Do you need a bunch of zucchini and squash because you will get to the point where you are ready to throw them at people or, you know, it's not a bad idea. You can always give them to the chickens, but we're going to have somebody on this program a little bit later in the show to talk about what you can do with those things. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, um, the zucchini mom, because she put back so much zucchini last year, she only grew one zucchini plant this year. Yeah. And it's probably got more than enough. I mean, we've got so much of this stuff put back and you know what? I'm not complaining. Thank the Lord. Because I think we're getting into those times, and we've talked about it before, where it almost certainly is going to be tough all the way around. In fact, every single indicator, every marker out there, even the people that are not alarmists, people like, okay, despite, check this out. Jack Spearco, he's a friend of mine. He hosts the Survival Podcast. And despite the name, you would think that he would be an alarmist, but he is not. If anything, he's been one of those reality voices that have been telling people forever and a day Don't lose your mind. Calm down. Here's what's really happening. You got people like him and a number of others that are very sober-minded in terms of the information they deliver. In fact, some of the best in the world. In fact, I consider Jack probably the best in the podcast realm, especially within anything remotely close to his genre. I can give you all the whys and what fors. Now, when you hear people like him doing shows like, okay, this it's I'm going to paraphrase, but basically it's all falling apart. Now he qualifies it and he and he's not saying it's going to happen tomorrow, but it is a mathematical certainty that these things will happen. So do what you want with that information. Anyway, <laughs> coming up on in ways to mitigate what's about to happen, you got festivals out there where you're going to mix with other people that might see things a little bit differently from you. One of those places is Kentucky Sustainable Living. Now, October, September and October, November, I mean, basically, those are the times where that's where things are kind of slowing down a little bit on your homestead, if it's not Permapastures Farm. Yeah. And whereas a lot of people kind of ease into the winter, we don't normally do that. We've been busting our butts all the way through it. And um, I don't see this winter being a whole lot differently, depending on what we got, you know, on, on a few things that we're waiting on. But if you're needing to find a place to go cross-pollinate, or even commiserate with some of the other folks out there. October 28th and 29th, Kentucky Sustainable Living in Bowling Green, Kentucky. I'm going to be there, and um, I am really looking forward to it. Now, hopefully my grandchild doesn't arrive at that same time, or I'll be on the first (laughs) thing smoking out of there. But they also have, now this is important, they also have a VIP dinner, and the proceeds go to help Veterans for Child Rescue. Now, everybody's aware of that movie that just came out. This is not the same people. They do something else entirely. But if you want to go ahead and break bread with, you know, me and a number of other people out there, all for a party with a purpose, a serious cause to help out these children that are stuck in child sex trafficking, there's your way to do it. So go check that out. 
All right, with that said, we're going to move into the homesteading pastor, Pastor Lon. Hello, everyone. This is Pastor Lon. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, in Paul's writing, he said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. As Paul was pressing toward that mark, you and I should be pressing toward that same mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, the prize that God's spirit would be in our life and upon our life every day. And then ultimately that prize, we would inherit eternal life in heaven with him, with God Almighty. But I got to think about this game of life. In the game of life, winning is everything. We've often heard in the sports arena that it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. And there's a lot of truth to that. You're not going to win all the time, and whether if you lose, you've got to be a good sportsman about it. But in the game of life, it's totally different. Although life is very serious, and not, a, and not just a game, it's a lot like winning a game. You see, many things in life can be lost, and life goes on, just like in a regular game. But the difference is, when this game of life is over, we had better be on the winning side, because there are no second chances in this game called life. You either win or you lose. So I ask you today, where do you stand with Jesus and what prize are you pressing for in life? Amen to all that. Go yeah. check Pastor Lon out over there at Homesteading Pastor. You can check him out on YouTube. I mean, extraordinary, extraordinary um, thoughts and extraordinary family. I mean, it's in my life, I've never known a person that had wore more hats, he and his wife both, and still managed to just be such a blessing in Still everybody managed. else's life. Yeah, just manage. <laughs> just stand, yeah, I mean, it's just, man, just something else. But, yeah, you want to be fulfilled? That's where I go to church. Go check out the Homesteading Pastor on YouTube. All right. So, bad news, good news. Before I get into that, remember, um, Harvest Right Freeze Dryers. Got a link down below if you need one because we got them things running all the time right now. So, bad news. Right off. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to... Okay, we we had a couple of de, uh, had a couple of glitches here. Okay, so bad news right off the bat. There's a uh, woman that was being interviewed on a burning platform. And her name is Dr. Vandana Vandana Shiva, and she basically quotes says uh, Bill Gates in Silicon Valley behind the push for farming without farmers, food without farms, and she's on there with uh, that English guy. Man, what is his name? Um, is it Barber? No. no, never mind. Russell Brand, that's oh, him. Yeah. She's on there with this guy, and she is dropping it like it's unbelievably hot and dropping all this news over there, basically coming out shooting the bows and arrows against this Bill Gates and all the others like him, where she's going to see things more. She th she sees things more in a, in a more left side of the paradigm. But she makes a really stunning point. That when you get down to brass tacks, when these people have what she calls a disproportionate level of land ownership and they're tying up this land and you're planting poisons on it, well, I'm going to respond with my um, liberty-minded perspective. And I'm going to say, what about the tragedy of the commons? Yeah. And that's one thing that a lot of people don't address. For example, let's say there's a stream and it's running through your property uphill and mine downhill. But on your property, like one of the people around this loop here, yeah. you got pigs literally in the creek. In the creek. What a complete dope. You got pigs pooping in that creek, doing everything else. Upstream. Now, upstream. <laughs> and he's contaminating the water to everybody else downstream. Now, I haven't complained it because I'm not I'm not anywhere downstream. Right. But the point being, that is a tragedy because we all have got to share that commons. And if I'm the guy downstream, it's coming to me. And that's where supposedly if we have a legal system that actually works, that somebody could adjudicate and say, nope. But now I think, you know, you can base on what's happening right now and our status quo, whether or not that legal system's working well, out. Well, this is where I think the rule, like you can do whatever you want as long as it doesn't negatively affect anybody else. That's where I think that protects the tragedy of the commons is that, okay, you can do whatever you want, as long as it's not negatively affecting anybody else, pigs pooping in the upstream of a river is negatively affecting everybody else downstream. Or your GMO crop over on your yep. property is like Bill Gates, going right back to what she's talking yep. about here. Your GMO crop is affecting me over here 
and I mean, it's like Dr. Ingham even talks about too, where all the remediation I'm having to do on my property because of you spraying your junk over there, mm -hmm. who should have to pay for that? Who should yeah. have to pay for that remediation? But there is a documentary out there called the world or Mon the world against Monsanto or something like that, man, it came out a while ago. And if you look at the unbelievable carnage that they have created on this planet, it'll just absolutely floor you. But that's exactly where we're getting back to where you, okay, Bill Gates, yeah, you can have all the land you want, but if you're growing poison or you're sending out your poison mosquitoes and all this other stuff. I got a solution. All right. So you know how they're sending all those illegals up to New York? Let's make, hey, let's, let's help them out. Let's send them out to Bill Gates's farms, all that farmland. Let's help them out. Let's teach them perm permaculture. Let's get them growing food. It's not slavery they chose to be here, but let's get them growing food. No, man, I wouldn't even put, I wouldn't I put would those people them, on no GMO crops. No, 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 no. I wouldn't no, put no. them out there. It's like. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying do anything like G GMO crops or have them uh, farm Bill Gates. I'm saying take over that farmland. I would rather, I would much rather employ. Oh, I see and what you're saying. Work. Requisition them. Yeah. But man, I would you much had me rather worried employ, for a second no, there. No, no, no. I want to employ and put to work these illegals because I would much rather have them have the property than bill gates what's he gonna breed mosquitoes yeah okay drop them off up there but you better get him some cold weather gear because it is blazing cold you in can Nebraska. stay if you get your pdc in three months no i'm not for <laughs> staying for any reason man if you didn't come here the right way um in fact we're, we're going to cover that here in a second here so let's get on to the good news joe biden fired prosecutor investigating burisma for corruption because the company was paying Hunter for protection. Now, I put that in here to put an exclamation point on the previous story <laughs> about you need legitimate courts to adjudicate yeah. these things in a fair way. Okay. We got Hillary Clinton over here busting up servers with hammers. Ain't no crime there. We got Joe Biden caught on tape saying you better fire this dude, and he was bragging about it, and still... No crime. You got Hunter Biden in this picture here. He looks like he's probably out there selling cucumbers on the side of the road. I mean, the guy looks, looks like evil. a yeah. I mean, he looks like a skunk. Just look at yeah. it. Well, sorry, my apologies to all the skunks out there. But my point <laughs> being, I brought that up to put an exclamation point on the previous story. If you don't have courts that can make decisions on the basis of the law, because there is no way that everybody in this administration. Mayorkas, Biden, Hunter Biden, for crying out loud, man. I mean, what do you got to do? I mean, this should be an exclamation point that we are far beyond a third world dictatorship at this point. I just can't Every, believe Joe Biden fired somebody for corruption. <laughs> well, or had somebody fired, supposedly. No, because he was actually not being corrupt. That's why he had him fired. But, I mean, that goes to show you that – you can't really trust a court concerning the tragedy of the commons when at the highest levels you see people getting away with murder and everything else. I mean, you name it. I mean, it's just sickening. It is absolutely sickening. So that was technically uh, good news. Yeah, we're going to call that good news. <laughs> well, speaking on the heels of what you just talked about, son, must have read my mind. New York City Mayor Adams says, check this out, illegal immigration under Biden has become a national crisis. Now, New York City, you know, they're rolling over the border, and that poll cut down in Texas. I mean, everybody seems to think he's doing a good job, but I'm not so sure about that. Uh, the governor, Abbott, yeah, Abbott, down in Texas, I'm not so sure because he's part of that whole Klaus Schwab uh, go to school to learn how to be a leader group. Same thing with that guy up in Canada. Same with thing with that guy over in Florida. Same with the guy in Russia. Yeah, all <laughs> these guys, I mean, that we think might be halfway decent good guys even have been through this school. So I want you to kind of kind of think this out. So anyway, he's putting them on the first thing, smoking up to New York City. Everybody's laughing. Everybody's saying, no, I'm not so sure he's not part of the whole thing. Because it wouldn't be that hard to secure the border with the National Guard down in Texas. Also, I mean, depending... If the uh, the reports of is it Peter Yan, the one that was down in the the Michael Yan, Michael Yan, um, with the reports of that, if they're just busing military aged men to the other side of the country, that doesn't seem like a good tactical move well, to help Michael, spread the forces 
for these other these foreign governments? Michael Yan and a number of others are down there. At current, he was at the Darien Gap in Panama. Now he's at the border. And they're coming over. They got FLIR. They got everything, every bit of technology you can possibly have right now. And and Vander Steele's down there with him. And she has a show on Brighteon. But we're looking at all these people that are just rolling right over. And you know what? Let's let's just think back to 2001. Okay? One of the things that woke me up regarding the status quo was we're fighting them over there so we don't have to fight them here. Remember hearing that, folks? And I remember thinking, at the same time, the Bush, the second Bush administration, he's like, oh, yeah, they're wanting to you know, legalize all these. And I'm like, hold on a minute. How is it, if we're in a war on terror, why are we not treating our borders like Al-Qaeda could potentially be coming across? Yeah. So it was that that moment where I woke up right then and there, and I knew the war on terror was a farce based on that alone. And so I woke up concerning 9-11 and a number of other things. I, I was awake concerning other things, but not everything. And here we are, right back at the border, all these years later, still nothing preventing yep. anybody from coming across with anything. And the, I think the least of our concerns are really the Mexicans. Well, when you get, well, in a bigger concern, they're actually, yeah. Well, you know, I would say so, well. considering the fact that there's, for some reason, a whole gang of Chinese people down in Mexico trying to cross the border. Exactly my point. <laughs> so why aren't we why aren't we treating our borders like Guantanamo Bay? You know what? Like I talked about it before, and believe me, I have knowledge. I have training on this. You don't make anything secure a border without an obstacle, which could be a minefield or a wall. It has to be protected by a threat, and it has to be observed. If you employ two without all three, it will not work. Well, where do these? Where does this work? That we know that it works. Not a single living thing crosses Guantanamo Bay, and they do all three. Not a single thing crosses the border between North and South Korea. Unless, unless it's propaganda. <laughs> unless you're so well, they got places where you can't cross. Oh, okay. And, but I, I guarantee you, you didn't cross a fast cam minefield on foot. I guarantee it. It doesn't happen. It can't happen. So these are doctrine. This is military doctrine that we know absolutely Nate, works. Here, and this is your pimp cast tip of the day. Today's tip, money equals energy. People in permaculture tend to see money as something negative, but money is simply a convenient means of exchange. It is neither good nor bad. What you do with it can be positive or negative. You can facilitate abundance or scarcity. Bill Mollison said the best way to compare any two things was to give everything a kilowatt hour value. It takes energy to produce anything, so this is the most equitable method to compare values. I think the best way to view money is a representation of energy. It takes time and effort to earn it, and your time is also a representation of energy. As Bill also said, there is no free lunch in nature. Every transaction is an exchange of energy. You can find me on YouTube and Instagram at Eric Sider. And if you're in need of permaculture t-shirts or remote permaculture consultation and design, head over to ericsider.com. All right. Welcome back. And um, as you as you see, we're going to have a little change out because the host I have in here with me today, my co-host, is none other than Matt Hunley from Farm, or I'm sorry, Homestead for Living. And he's in the house. My well, I guess you're about my third in-studio guest. So, oh, wow. Yes, but he's here for a very, very special reason. So he, his wife Gabby, and uh, their baby are, uh, well, Gabby and the baby are downstairs, and Michelle's mm -hmm. down there spoiling him rotten, <laughs> getting a little bit of practice. And at the same time, Matt and I are here to talk about something that we've kind of teased a little bit up until this point in the PimCast. And it has to do with a resource that we join forces on to make happen. So, Matt, why don't you just go ahead and let the audience know exactly what I'm talking about? All righty. I'll start with the backstory because I think that kind of makes Absolutely. it all make sense. So, uh, I remember really distinctly, I, I believe it was last year at the, uh, the Back to Land Festival, we were hanging out behind the booths and um, just sort of chatting about what the different billions of projects we had going on and, and wanted to tackle. 
And one you mentioned was you had an idea for a book that you had wanted to write. And I won't say the name that you were thinking about because I feel like it's a great name and you're going you're gonna to write that book. Um, I also had one that like I was playing around with in my head, um, but just didn't see any way to make it happen and didn't seem very realistic. Um, but the concepts were so similar, the idea was, well, why don't we join forces on this? Um, especially with um, Gabby, my wife, being in the camp, she worked for HarperCollins, which was a book publishing company. So she had all of the technical know-how of how to actually make a project like this happen. So we came to the, the conclusion that we should just write a book together. Um, take your ideas and my ideas and, and write a, a, a resource, as you mentioned, that um, what it is is people can take this resource and use it to figure out how to become much more self-sufficient from any starting point. And so the title that, after many title changes, what we landed on was Scrap Steading. And so the idea is, the title kind of implies, you can probably figure it out, is it was, we built our homesteads, both of us, from very similar backgrounds of very little in terms of financial resources. And through scraps, <laughs> literally, and just a scrappy mentality, we were able to access land that sometimes you didn't own, or that was um, substandard land. Um, or we were able to find food supplies to start feeding large quantities of animals that didn't cost us anything and that helped us not have to buy feed. Um, and so what we do in the book is we talk about all of these methods that both of us collectively have learned separately on our journeys. Um, and we talk about how people can do all of this. So how they can go out and find land if they are living in a van under a bridge or if they have 10,000 in the bank or if they have a home or if they're renting, regardless of the starting point, they can either find land or find more land. Um, and then we talk about how to feed livestock, how to build gardens, how to build infrastructure from scrap materials, where to find these scrap materials. Um, my favorite part, I think, of, of, of the part that you did in the book is all of, is talking about the specifics of how to approach people. I know you, you probably take it for granted a bit because it, it's a kind of second nature to you, but I'm a very introverted person. And so that was not second nature to me. So as we were writing this book, I was learning things as I was transcribing stuff and then starting to implement that as well. And so I kind of got, I feel like, a first, uh, a first experience of like, okay, this book is going to work for people because it was, it was working for me as the co-author. Um, I was learning as we went. Um, so yeah, that's a rundown of what the book is. It's, it's how, to, how to actually homestead from any starting position. No capital, no money, some money, um, a lot of money, but especially written for those who don't have a lot of resources. Especially right in these times where it seems like every other pimp cast we're on here talking about how crazy things are getting in terms of, um, you know, the cost of everything. Well, it's really your dollar's worth less, but we'll go ahead and call it inflation, which all means pretty much the same yeah. thing. Folks, another good thing, one really awesome thing I think about this book is that it is very elegant. In other words, it's concise, it's simple, it's to the point, and it's, it can, depending on where your starting point is, you're going to have a reference somewhere in this thing it's only about 100 pages so it's designed specifically to be a quick read and to a certain extent even a reference point to where you can go in and let's say you want to know a little bit more about a particular thing well we guide you to where to find that information or and you know i, I think in this time where everybody's on the go everybody has limited time and definitely has limited money at least the people i know nobody has just you know, we're talking about using scraps, you know, everybody has access to that. And that was one of the things about what Matt does and what a couple of things really drew me to him from the very, very beginning in all of this. It was when this whole world was starting to get crazier and crazier and up in my YouTube feed pops up this guy. Didn't have a whole lot of followers at the time and frankly, neither did I. And I'm thinking, I like what's coming out of his mouth. And then the more and more he would produce these videos, I'm realizing, oh, shoot, he's taking bare bone stuff from dumps, from wherever he can find it, and he's making extraordinary stuff out of it. And I'm thinking, okay, there is, there is no more logical person to team up with to write a book like this than Matt. And so that was one of the beautiful things that not only he and Gabby, his wife, bring to bear, it's also this... Um, we were talking about this before you even showed up, and I'm going to be very, very frank here. I know a whole lot of people that say they're going to do stuff, or they think, oh, it'd be wonderful to start a homestead. Ladies and gentlemen, this guy literally did it starting in a repurposed crack house or meth house or whatever <laughs> Yeah, meth it was. lab. You got to get that yep. right. Yeah. Meth, lab, <laughs> meth, <laughs> meth lab that could not have been worse. And if you see what he turned it into and then bought the property next door, fixed it up, and then moved on and on and on. 
There's a whole lot of people out there that claim they want to do these things and they want to live this lifestyle, but you don't necessarily see the fruit. But with Matt and Gabby, I'm seeing all kinds of crazy. When I'd be out there visiting, Gabby's sitting there carrying sheetrock all by herself <laughs> through the house, stacking it up on the inside of this home that they are building themselves from the ground up. So you're getting this perspective in this book from literally two different places, but they still converge to the same place which I think is beautiful in a book like this because it you're seeing how to arrive at the same place from two different places, but at the same time, maybe with two different methods, with your ability to be able to go to these places, find the materials you need, and maybe with my ability to go out there and say, okay, well, how do I open the door to this person? Also, how do I get the scraps that they're producing from their restaurants to be able to use it to feed my omnivores and the things that we're really, really good at? So we... We've been able to, in a in the most concise way, thanks to he and Gabby's editing, be able to distill this thing down in such a way to where it is a quick, healthy, to the point, hard hitting read at this time where we have less money and time for really any curricular, any extracurricular things these days, but also those pockets in there where you can find specific, to the point videos and resources on what exactly we're talking about so we don't have to have a 500 page book exactly. where it's concise and simple and to the point um matt people are going to want to know obviously where to find this thing and we're going to need a release date at some point um we'll cover it again later but why don't you tell them right off mm -hmm. where they can find it and the the time is going yeah. to be available. So I think we've settled today just a few minutes ago on august 14th it looks like we can pull it off by then um so August 14th will be the release date, and scrapsteading.com is the website that Gabby's got put together, and it'll the link to buy it will be there. Um, if this podcast comes out a few days before the release, then you'll be able to just sign up for an email, um, and then you'll you'll get an email when the book is ready. Uh, but we're literally, uh, I think we're about a week away, week or two away. Um, so yeah, scrapsteading.com, everything you need is right there for it. Now, you, we're also going to have a book signing at one of the festivals. Honestly, this thing built from the ground up from Matt and Gabby. It's called the Back to the Land Festival. Mm -hmm. And it's honestly one of my favorite festivals out there because it, the, the last time you could, not, you could not conjure a more homey festival. Not only was it good family fun, the entertainment was off the charts. I mean, the band, the bluegrass band you guys had there was absolutely fantastic. Food trucks that will knock your socks off, folks. I know this sounds crazy, but the best waffles I've ever had in my life was a dude out there. I don't remember the name of the food truck, but maybe you could have him back. And, and Billy's had a lot of waffles. Yes, so he's qualified. I have. <laughs> Believe me. I, In fact, I ate three of them. I ate two of them out of the sight of anybody else. I saw you hiding in a corner. Yeah, I was, I was back I there, the dude. Third or fourth one. Oh, my goodness. I'm like, okay, so you can get your book, go snatch up a couple of these waffles, get some coffee. And Matt's something of a coffee aficionado, so maybe you can steal some out of his urn <laughs> and go read this book because it is a quick, concise, to the point read. But why don't you tell them about this festival you got coming up and, um, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, the book signing that we'll have there? Yeah, so Back to the Land Festival, we're coming into our third year of doing it. Um, the first year was 2020, um, right in the midst of all the craziness. We said, let's start a gathering because that's what we're not supposed yeah. to do, is yeah. gather. So let's, let's do the opposite of that and gather together. Um, and it was an amazing time of connection. Very small. We had just about 100 people come out that first year. Um, but incredible people came from all over the country and shared all of the knowledge. And, like, everyone just picked up something and took care of it. Like, we didn't know how to throw a festival. Yeah. But everyone just came together. It was, so it was an amazing. It was like our little Woodstock, basically. Um, and then the second year, we grew. We, we had about 200 people out and had even more instructors this time and speakers. And uh, we did the hog butcher class the first year. And we did chickens the second year. Um, and had just incredible demonstrators. So this third this third year is really exciting. We're, we're shooting for about 400 people, attendees this year. We're having it at the Ag Pavilion in Hickman County, so that's a really cool facility, uh, really big and roomy. Um, and we're having, once again, really cool instructors talking about everything from uh, natural beekeeping, where they really talk about how to keep bees in a more permaculture way, in a way that's closer to nature, so you're not struggling so much with survivability because they're, they're living a more natural healthy lifestyle um things like that things like one that i'm excited to sit through is a solar class um the guy that's teaching it he's on the board of the uh the nonprofit that back to the land is um he is uh, i actually teach violin to his daughter 
And so I've seen their house, I see it every week. Their house is 6,000 square feet, very big house. It's a multi-generational house, so it's not like opulent, but it's a big house. And if you go into it, you wouldn't know it was any different than a house in the suburbs, but it's entirely run on solar. And he built the entire solar setup, brand new components for $20,000. Wow. So that's what he's going to be talking on is how can you build a real good solar system on a really good budget, like per square foot. That's maybe a tenth of what they would quote you if you went to a company to get it done. So that's the kind of instructors we're trying to have is like the really nitty gritty important stuff um, to learn to really launch your homestead or to take it to the next level. And it really overlays with what's in this book mm -hmm. is because, I mean, like you were talking about the solar guy, where it's taking things, especially in these days, y'all, where, look, I don't have to tell everybody out there, your money is worth less. It's worth less. And that's why a book like this and a festival like this, because there are a lot, look, folks, do not forsake the gathering of yourselves, especially right now. Mm -hmm. Everybody seems reluctant to sign up or commit to any festivals until the very last minute yeah. because they're wondering, okay, is the nuke going to come flying or anything like that? Look, folks, we can't live that way. we got to get out there, and it's going to make you feel less alone in the world. But Matt and I are also going to be signing this book out there, so we're, I'm really looking forward to that because um, I, in a million years, would have never guessed that I'd be signing anybody's book. Mm -hmm. And we're, we'll have it available there. And we're going, not only great fellowship, great food. Um, it's just a different vibe at this festival that you're going to find, that you're not going to find really too much. I love that the fact, I love the fact that they're intimate. Mm -hmm. They're very, very intimate. You get to have really good conversations. And you get to hang out with a bunch of people that you all, you wish were all your next door neighbors. And um, like I said, at the end of the day, we'll be doing this book signing there, and we hope to see all of you there because it is, without a doubt, my top two festivals that I love to go to. So, uh, Matt, is there anything else you want to leave people with? Where can everybody find you and Gabby? Yeah, so um, we have our YouTube channel, Homestead for a Living. We rather sporadically have been posting there, but now we're going to start stepping that up. Um, much of our time has been occupied with all of the, the details of getting this book up and off the ground, so we are there. Um, we're building out our physical, our actual brick and mortar nursery out in Tennessee. So if you happen to be anywhere near Hickman County, Tennessee, um, you can hit us up there. Um, our website is hollowtopfarms.com. And uh, those are the main spots to find us other than actually at the festival or at scrapsteading.com where the book will be. I got to say, I've never been more excited about teaming up with somebody for a project on something because this is one of the few people I know in this world that actually walks the walk and talks the talk. I mean it. I mean it. I've seen the progression in an unbelievably, astonishingly fast period of time. Where in this place, in this area, in this world where we live, where so many people are more polished than spit and more glitter than grit, mm. it's cool to know somebody like Matt, who I know for a fact is actually doing these things making a living now i mean that's the name of your your youtube channel is homestead for a living i mean you didn't start off there overnight and right. a lot of the things that are written in this book could easily be adapted to anybody that's getting started out there where they might take a piece of it of some of the things we're providing in here and make a real deal you know way you maybe you're not going to be one of the rockefellers well hopefully not because that means <laughs> you'd probably be drinking blood or something but or a reptilian or whatever um, you're not going to wind up that way, but you could, in fact, make a living at doing it, as both mm -hmm. of us do right now. Yeah, yeah, and that's the that's the that's kind of a side thing. Besides just homesteading, becoming self sufficient, one of our passions for Gabby and myself is we are advocates of financial self sufficiency. 2020 was such a wake up call for yes. us that our our ability to make a living and buy food and acquire the things we need to live it seemed like it might just be dependent on our compliance with things that we don't agree with and with medical interventions we didn't want to be involved with and things like that. So it was such a big wake-up call in 2020 that not only do we need to figure out how to make a living truly from our homestead, even if it's just three acres or four acres, um, but also we want to, like, as we figured out, we want to be putting this information out there and teach others how to do it as well. Um, I, I think that's going to be what's going to make a strong nation again will be a bunch of independent, independent people that don't need a centralized source of power anymore. And he's really, really good at all that, folks. Um, man, it's been such a pleasure to have you in the studio, folks. When we get back, we'll get straight into your Q&A. All right, hope you all enjoyed that. Um, wow. Now I'm a writer. So that's going to be coming out really, really soon. All right, we got a new segment on the show, and it's going to feature one of my homeboys. His name is Chef Keith 
Snow, and he's going to be covering something I think you want to know about. Hey, it's Chef Keith Snow with Harvest Eating and FoodStorageFeast.com with a little culinary quick tip for zucchini. Now, this is prime time for zucchini, and if you grow it, you're seeing lots of them on your plants. That's a good thing. I like zucchinis that are about 6 to 10 inches long at maximum. They have many culinary uses, not just for zucchini bread, which I happen to love as well. Um, but today's quick tip is about the ones that are hidden under the leaves or you just we're going to get to it and you didn't right away and they got too big now inside of those is a pretty nasty um, spongy watery seed pocket now no amount of culinary magic is going to make that texture palatable so most people are going to get that in their mouth and be like Ugh. so what do you do when it gets too big well you just want to either use a grater and you can just grate the zucchini um, without getting any of the seed pod, then you can make a zucchini bread out of it, or you just slice it off in long slabs, about a quarter to maybe three eighths of an inch thick, and that will leave you with just a long kind of uh, nasty seed pocket. And you can take that and throw it to your chickens. You can put it in the compost pile. You can throw it at one of your liberal neighbors. I mean, you could do whatever you want with it but you're probably not gonna to wanna to eat it. So what you're left with are nice slabs of firm zucchini, which can be diced up and put to use with many, many recipes. Now, just a couple of things to get you thinking. Um, I like to make uh, pasta dishes where as the pasta is boiling and it's in salted water and it's very al dente, in front of that pot, you have a skillet with the condimento, in other words, the things that are going to make the pasta taste good. In this case, you could start out with a um, little bit of extra virgin olive oil, the diced up zucchini, some garlic, um, saute that for a few minutes, deglaze a little white wine. Then you take your al dente um, noodles, put it into the skillet with some of that amazing um, starch rich pasta water, and you continue cooking the pasta, taking it from super al dente to nice and tender. You turn off the heat. You can add some Parmesan cheese, some ricotta cheese, maybe some fresh basil, and you have a really great pasta dish. Another thing that I always love to do with those zucchini pieces is put them on top of pizza. They're great in pizza. They are great in soup. They make a great saute. Now, there's a, a dish that people who know Italian food know, and it's basically toasted bread with you know some manner of tomatoes on it. In Italy, they call it bruschetta. Um, that's amazing stuff. And years ago, I put a video on my YouTube channel, and that was basically a ratatouille bruschetta. So I make a ratatouille, zucchini, summer squash, eggplants, peppers, tomatoes, garlic, olive oil, all that kind of stuff cooked way down to a, almost like a paste. And then you use it on top of some really hearty bread. And you, you toast the bread and then take raw garlic, rub it on the bread, put some of this um, zucchini mixture on there. And you've got something really great. But the point is not to throw those large zucchinis out because I've seen people do that. Oh, it's too big. Get rid of it. And you definitely don't want to serve it because of the spongy seed pocket I mentioned before. So with that, I hope you can get some use out of those larger zucchinis. wanted to also invite all of you to check out my website, foodstoragefeast.com. This is a site where I teach you how to cook with stored foods, simple things like rice, beans, oats, corn, wheat, pasta. Um, and there's about 55 videos in that website. And if you want to sign up for that, you can use the coupon code PERMA and save $25. I wanted to thank Billy and William for the awesome pimp cast, which I listen to every single episode the moment it comes out. Thanks, guys. And wanted to say thanks to the audience and take care. All right, here's the problem yeah. I'm having right yes, now. I'm having the same I'm, problem. Dude, I've been fasting <laughs> 6 o'clock mark 24 hours, and I'm like, dude, i got to turn him off. Dude. I'm going to hit this button. Chef Snow, what was I thinking? Man, yeah, hey, Chef Snow, I'm going to need you to stick to carnivore or keto recipes. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're killing me with this pasta. <laughs> oh, man. I'm sitting here over here salivating yeah. like Pavlov's dog, and I'm like, good night, man. I am I am sitting here like okay, this first of all it's a fantastic segment. 
Yeah. Because the next zucchini time. is one of those things that, <laughs> just like we were talking a moment ago, it's like cucumbers and a number of others, squashes, where you love it at first, and then you're like, what on earth do I do now? So, yeah. you know, Chef Snow definitely provides. But I'm thinking, man. dude, I picked one screwed up time to do a 40-hour <laughs> fast, man, because I'm sitting here thinking, oh, man, what? <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, as soon as you mentioned, like, throwing the starchy water, I don't know why it was this, but it was like throwing the starchy water back into the, the sauce. I think it's because it's, like, part of my favorite pasta dish that, uh, what is it? Peas and prosciutto or carbonara, I think. Yeah. Um, but th that whenever you said that, that just <laughs> put me over the top. Dude. You're killing me, man. He, he, okay, he had me with bruschetta. First of all, I've been pronouncing it wrong all the yep, years. Same here. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. Well, I'm I'm approaching the end. I think I'm about a week and a half away of the end of 75 hard. And you just started today, so well, that's, that's what's the, making it really tough. It's not the the seventy five hard that I'm doing. I'm doing the phase one of part two, which, if I ever meet Andy, I'm gonna ask him about this organization of the seventy five or seventy five uh, year thing. Um, but it's part one of phase two, which is a thirty day challenge. If I mess up, then I have to start over at uh, at the thirty days. Um, but it includes a cold shower. Uh, five minutes of visualization, um, and then also three more additional tasks for the day. Yeah, so you're off and running on that. And, and, then, and plus everything that the 75 Hard includes. Right, so it's a Live Hard program. Live Hard program, that's it. There yep. you go. So, yeah, he's on to that, and I'm near the end of 75 Hard, and I'm sitting here thinking, I'm already dreading. I, I know this sounds crazy. Yep. I, I'm already like, okay, I got all these things I plan to eat at least a day of, but I'm like, okay, am I really going to do it? Yeah. I'm telling you right now, that shoe fly pies have my name on it. I'm going to, I'm going to definitely beat that thing up. I'm going to tear up that ice cream and then I'm probably going to make myself sick. And then I'm probably going to go right back in because I've never been more productive in my oh, life. Oh, you have to wait. You have to wait 30 days before you no, go I back. Know, I know that, one. but I'm saying, I'm just going to keep on doing what I'm doing. I'm just going to modify it a little bit better where I can probably maybe put on some muscle because right now, you know, do two 45 minute workouts a day is a little much. If you're trying to put on, I mean, I, I weighed at the gym and I'm under 170, I think now. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So well, you know, is, that, that scales accurate. That old school. Yeah. It's with everything on, I was 172 and I was like, come on, man. I've jumped off that thing. I'm like, is this thing right? Did you have your shoes on? My shoes, my knife, All everything. that's about like six to eight pounds usually whenever yeah, so I I'm weigh myself. I'm definitely under 170, and I'm like, I don't, man, this is very weird for me, man. I'm about 175, which I don't know. It, All right. Yeah. Well, I hey, might be a little too tall for that. <laughs> I need to put on some muscle, I think. Well, son, you, uh, look at me, man. I could hang glide on a Dorito. I mean, I'm I'm <laughs> getting down to where I, I'm down to – down to my last inch of skin. We're looking like we're not good at homesteading. Yeah, no kidding, man. We're the only, <laughs> yeah, the only homesteaders that ought to be on Schindler's list. <laughs> All right, y'all. So um, before we get into the Q&A, uh, EMP Shield, y'all, 50 bucks off with promo code PERMA, P-E-R-M-A. And uh, remember, all the reasons we've talked about before, I mean, it looks like we're trying to pick a fight with Russia right now, so don't be shocked if a couple of Poseidons come landing at your front door. Uh, with all joking aside, though, your number one threat out there is definitely going to be lightning. So that's the number one reason why I have EMP Shield on the house. It arrests light, my number one threat, which is lightning. So if it does get past it and it blows anything up downstream, 25 G's is what they cover you for. So uh, EMP Shield, promo code PERMA. So let's get right into the Q&A. We don't have a whole lot this week, and that's fine. Uh, so we just spend time on the ones we do have. And for some reason... I got one ready if you can't find it. No, I got everything oh, okay. handy. It's just... Uh, all right. So uh, check this one out. We got one from uh, Precision Lawn uh, Lawn and Grounds. Do you have any tips or info where to start with fixing my pasture? I got goats. It's about one and a half anchors, and it's overrun with uh, ground ivy or creeping Charlie. So 40 to 50%. Last year, I pulled about 1,000 feet of it and seeded it and came right back. Have a huge amount of curly dock, common ragweed, orig uh, oriental lady's thumb, and sickle pod. 
Uh, we've been at this property three years. I thought the goats would take care of everything, but yeah, I guess he yep. just found out goats won't eat no creeping Charlie. So, dude, that sounds like something they ought to call Hunter Biden. Sounds like creepy the, Charlie, <laughs> or that, or it sounds like a reference to somebody who's about to get thrown into a wood chipper. Well, he's trying not to use. Yeah, you got that. <laughs> okay, so yeah, one ties into the other yeah. once again. So he says he doesn't want to use Grayson, and um, I'm going to tell you the only thing I know of that might be able to deal with that. And that's going to be the good old pick. Um, part of what your problem is, I haven't had a chance to research it fully, but I wonder if you have a seriously bacterially dominated soil. And if you can move that over to fungal, I wonder if that would take it away a little bit. Now, there's, I can't possibly explain to you how you could do that right now, but maybe one of the, uh, one of the strategies I would take if I was dealing with the same problem I get pigs in there that root. First of all, maybe a pig out there that eats it because the digestive system, you'll find that with pigs, what they won't eat, goats eat. What goats eat, pigs don't eat. So it's vice versa. Whatever a goat doesn't eat, usually a pig does. So I do a little research on that and find out if anybody's feeding that to pigs. If nothing else, they're going to beat that ground up a little bit. And immediately after, you want a fast-growing legume of some type or... It may see every situation is going to be a little bit different. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it depends on um, what is the reasoning behind having goats. Is it for meat and milk? Um, and then you're also thinking they could clear up this pasture, or are you getting goats strictly just to clear up the pasture? Because if you're looking for meat and milk, then I would recommend just getting rid of the goats. It, and he's going to he's sheep. wanting to get rid of Creeping Charlie. That was the main thing. That's the main okay. thing. He's wanting to get rid of the Creeping Charlie. The only thing I can think of is maybe when the weather gets a little bit better, like late spring, maybe have those pigs work it over, see if they will eat it, let them beat up the ground, and the moment you get them out there, I'd be putting buckwheat and cow pee all over that because I think part of the reason, like I said, I need more research on this, part of the reason that Creeping Charlie is taking a foothold, a lot of times I suspect is that you don't have a fungal component to your soil. Right. Also, I think if you... Like after the pigs, immediately after you move the pigs to the next paddock, put down some sort of carbon source like uh, wood chips or straw or even, I mean, hay would be preferable to Creeping Charlie. But at least that gives food to the fungal I would aspect. do that through the winter, though. I yeah. would put down yeah. it, because in the winter, now I don't know where your area is exactly, but I would do that primarily in the winter. And part of the reason being is that if that stuff, if you can knock it back and then put down something that will ultimately be a fungal component, then all through the winter until spring, it's going to be kind of the, the microbes that are in there are going to help you mix that into the soil. So if it doesn't come back, I don't have a whole lot of experience with creeping Charlie, but things like it. So I'm guessing you got a hive. You almost need a soil test there. And we're going to tell you the test for very different things. I would a find out what life is. A proper soil test. A soil test is looking after bacterial. So um, that's looking after your, your soil life, your soil life right. not NPK. Couldn't care less about that. Just look at your soil life. I'd start there. But honestly, just from a permaculture perspective, if I didn't have any of the knowledge I currently do, what I would do is have pigs go in there, wipe it out. And the day, in fact, I would even have an, I'd have them wipe it out in such a way because I've done it up this mountain I'd wipe it out in such a way to where I go in there with maybe some small seeds make sure they're nice fat and happy or whatever let them trample that in for a day and then hit it again and then see what comes back um that's the only thing the holistic thing don't have don't know enough about creeping charlie but I would almost bet a buffalo nickel that you got a serious imbalance maybe a compaction issue oh any yeah. number of things or erosion issue I would guess erosion issue well, that's usually what Creeping Charlie is there to prevent. Yeah, is that's erosion what I'm issues. So that's where I'd start. Let me know how it works out for you. Got one from uh, Not in Need of Rulers from the Fountain app. I like that name. Uh, and it's in reference to the Chicken Tractor on Steroids episode, episode 115. Bigfoot, Catholic Church shenanigans, alien distraction, the book of uh, Enoch, or eunuch, depending on that, how he spelled it. Um, I don't know if he's trying to make a joke there. Stargates, AI, demons, they are coming. Now is the time to prepare. I line the perimeter of my house with salt and vinegar every week now. It's working for now. Thanks for your info. Hmm. Yeah, salt make sure you add some lead in there too. <laughs> <laughs> maybe two, maybe the two-legged demons come looking for you too, you know. 
Yeah. Especially these yeah. days. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, you stay alert, stay alive for real. All right, Michelle says, uh, I've been binge watching or binge podcast episodes. Just listen to the bonus episode about biochar. You and Jack were talking about fire ants. Friend of mine, a friend of mine told me to try dry grits and sprinkle them on the mound. The ants carry them back to the mound and feed it to the queen. The grits act like rice when birds eat rice. The ants explode. Well, wow. Didn't know I, that. I didn't know that. And um, It's a waste of grits, though. Well, it depends on the grits. I mean, <laughs> yeah, if you get them depend. nasty Uncle Ben's grits, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you knock yourself get some out. Some of them mini grits. <laughs> yeah, some of them instant grits. Yeah. No self-respect in Southern East, no <laughs> instant grits. But, yeah, um, so for anybody out there with a the fire ant problem, I know a lot of people hit us up about it, and I told you some methods. I just found a way to work with them. When, I, when we were in Texas, that's all I did. I just let them do my soil exchange for me. I mean, there wasn't no getting rid of them. They didn't really cause any harm unless it's to unless you. Unless you stood in them, yeah. Yeah. So I was like, okay, they didn't really do much damage here. Let's figure out a way to work with them. Also, after visiting Australia, fire ants ain't that bad. That's an I think we need huh? to put it all in perspective. There <laughs> yeah. you go. Those those ants over there will shut your day down. Um, I got two. I got a comment on the YouTube channel, uh, Permaculture Pimp Cast from two old uh, two turtles homestead. Great content as always. Just to confirm about the rice and rising prices, we started buying rice from Sam's to feed our chickens after watching the Chicken Tractor on steroids videos. Two years ago, a 25-pound bag was eight ninety eight. Today, it's thirteen ninety eight. And just yesterday, I saw ribeye steaks at the grocery store for twenty four ninety nine a pound. I came straight home and ordered an eighth of a cow from a local butcher and seven pounds of which is a, and for seven dollars a pound, which is a hundred uh, pounds of finished products. And even wow. that, I seven hundred bucks for seven uh, for a hundred pounds of meat. Yeah, but it'll be well worth it in the coming days. I mean, yeah. they're they're folks. Just look around you. Everybody out there in this global elite is doing every look. I'm not believing. You know, it's because of the. Uh, you know, they're having this rice famine over there in India. Yeah. Weather issues. Huh. Got weather issues over here. Yeah, you can call it climate change all you want, but I heard of this thing called HARP, and they got a yeah. number of ways in which they can steer this weather, make it do crazy things. Look, y'all, it is the middle of summer, and I had a jacket on today. I'm dead serious. Your mom had a sweatshirt on, too. Yeah, this morning. I think we all started with j- jackets on this morning. Yeah. Yeah, the, with the rain and just, it was like, what? 50s yeah 60s? i mean it, it was it's crazy we're seeing stuff now there there's sun issues there's all these other things now what they want to call anthropomorphic and i can never say that anthropomorphic climate change i'm calling pollution that's why they don't call it pollution because if they called it pollution both the left and the right can agree on that yeah but they they come up with some nonsense first it was uh global warming then it's climate change. The climate always changes. <laughs> you know, they, it should. <laughs> you know, no, no, no. I'm, that's why I'm saying, no, 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 no. What about all you people that were on board with global warming? And then if you go back far enough, when I was a kid, it was global cooling. So every time you turn around, they got to change it up. And then people just suck it up and buy it. No, they have weather manipulation out there. They do it with chemtrails. They do it with harp. This is technology that they had ever since, well, before Operation Popeye, which is openly declassified. So the people calling me conspiracy nut, go look for yourself. Operation Popeye yeah. in Vietnam. We had the ability to steer storms back then and long before then. So that's, like I said, that's just one of the many declassified. Look at Lyndon Johnson when he was vice president. Gave a speech out there. Dame Wigington of Geoengineering Watch plays it all the time where Lyndon Johnson Johnson openly admitted, that's before he was in on having Kennedy assassinated, um, openly admitted right there that we had the technology back then. Look, y'all, the tech, you're, are you really thinking the combustion engine is the best thing we still have? Yeah. Really? Yeah. It hasn't developed in over 100 years. You're telling me they have patents for people that had tires that could go for 200,000 miles. Well, Ford GM, they bought up the patents. They got a carburetor back in the day that could easily go 100 miles on one, on one tank. They bought that up. So look at uh, the guy who was in charge of skunk works at Lockheed, Ben Rich. 
before he died and he knew he was dying, he said, now check this out, openly stated that we had the technology to take E.T. home back then, but it would never see the light of day because it was tied up in black budgeting projects. Yeah. That's where it's all going. We have a what? We have a breakaway civilization, and I wish I could remember the name of the guy that coined that term uh, because he was a really awesome guy when I met him. But we have essentially a breakaway civilization. This is what Eisenhower talked about. And I got to still sit here and listen to these dopes out there call me a conspiracy theorist when off the top of my head, you know, I remember these cackling hens one time back in uh, Leavenworth, Kansas, laughed at me because I had right at my mental Rolodex, I could pull this stuff up, the articles and all this stuff back when they could find it, back when I cared enough to convey this stuff. And they sat there, one sat there, looked to the other. There were four of them. You are a conspiracy theorist. And they they all started laughing at me. And then what I responded, I can't. I said, can't repeat here. No, I can repeat. (laughs) I said, well, I said, I guess it's a little bit better, a little bit better than being a coincidence theorist whose highest motive in life is uh, the next pair of shoes she's going to buy from Jimmy Shoe or whatever. It was a little more clever than what I'm stating right now. But the point being, here we are, all this information out there. You got all this stuff right at the tip of your fingers, and I still got a pe- pe- Oh, that's a conspiracy theorist. Okay, whatever. Yeah, go ahead and hit that sonic happy hour. Yeah, there you go. Uh, got one from Special K720. Or did you have one, Dad? Go ahead. Okay. Got one from Special K7209 on the YouTube channel. Beautiful family living together. Working as one is simple. They show it. Ego, deceit, laziness, and especially selfishness destroys families, people in general. You're meant for radio, podcasts, unfortunately. Um, the powers that will be throw a toolbox of wrenches in your efforts to reach people. Uh, honest and common sense thinking, thinking in general, please p- keep putting out information just as you're doing and don't put on the brakes. Thank you so much. And hey, by, hey, by the way, y'all, leave your uh, reviews, your five-star reviews down there. We definitely could use them. Yeah. Because the powers that shouldn't be don't want this out here. They don't want the information out there. And I want to thank you so much for that kind word. Yeah. Also want to give a shout out to my man Strider47 oh, for the yeah. very cool gift. Yeah, that was awesome. He sent a... Uh, he sent a book. It's a children's book for a uh, baby. It's the cutest thing ever. I was flipping through that book ever uh, earlier, and uh, he sent a children's book for the baby that's coming. And it's the name of the book is uh, My Little Regenerate or Little Regenerative Farmer. And it talks about this little girl who wants chickens, and then she comes up with her grazing plan and all that. And then the neighbors throw a fit, and then she goes over there and gives them eggs and show them what they're doing, and then befriends the neighbors and. Yeah, it's an awesome, well thought out book. Well, it sounds like it goes right in line with what Angela's saying here because she's basically in an area where the city, she's basically going up. I, I can't read all of it because it's rather lengthy, but in a nutshell, she's basically in a place where the town council, they give you five minutes and then they cut you off. And she's talking about things that are, you know, like the uh, and RF antennas on top of the water tower in town. She's trying to make it, you know, known that this stuff is detrimental. And then also, you know, dealing with things like, uh, you know, chicken coops in the backyard. Angela, I'm going to tell you right now. Tell them that you don't have chickens. They identify as dogs. They identify as bald eagles. Dare them to do something with that. Look, these are endangered species. Look, I did a video on this before. People thought I was joking, but I am deadly serious. If you thought I was deadly serious about that, I'm not so serious about the video that's going to come out tomorrow. (laughs) So we'll talk about that later. Well, you'll see it when yeah, it comes. You'll, you'll, you'll know yeah. for sure. Yeah, so it's going to be more on the lighter side, which is why I did the video on how to deal with code people. Honestly, seriously, not just Angela, but everybody else out there, think of the mental jujitsu that you can apply to turn these people on their heads. I am dead serious. If you have an animal like a rooster or whatever, tell them, like William said, it identifies as a bald eagle. Or when they come over there, if a if a if they can if they can play this stuff when they want to, use the same idiotic nonsense back on them. Yep. Got one from Mandy Garrett. Uh, she says, "LOL, being Asian myself, we are good at sourcing for, sourcing for stuff at low price." Thank you. She's talking about the going to the Asian store during pandemics because they're man, always fully stocked. I'm telling you what, man. I'm almost <laughs> wondering, man, should I have said that? Because I'm telling you, those guys weren't missing nothing. I love going to that place too, because it's like, 
if you just kind of suspend your reality for a moment, like no matter the city, it's literally like you just walked into another well, you did walk into another culture completely. Yeah, you and did. And they're playing the music, and they have things in there you're never going to find in an American grocery store. And it even has some of the writing from other countries on it. And they have stuff ev- from everywhere. I mean, whether they're Filipinos, they got stuff in there for them. Whether you're from Tonga, they got stuff from there. The, I mean, you name it. Any Any culture out there that's off the beaten path they have it all covered in this particular place, and it's really, really awesome. Folks, if you haven't done it before, even if you're not there to buy anything, if you just go in there and window shop, you know what else I really like? Well, hold Is on, Dad. You ain't doing any window shopping there. Well, no. Because you got about five minutes to pick out what you want, or else they're going to come look like, hey, you ain't done yeah, well, you got that. <laughs> well, they know me. I mean, I'm their best customer, but when I go in there, I'm after specific things, but... If you buy some of this other candy that isn't yeah. made for Americans, mm-hmm. you find out how much better it tastes. Like the tea candy I got that time. Oh, yeah. And I got a bunch of it. So, in, like, if you got a candy dish in your house, which, you know, we had one. I kind of got rid of it. But even their butterscotch, their version of a butterscotch is phenomenal. The tea candy, made out of tea. The coffee candy Man, I had to get rid of that out of the house because Man. I was eating that stuff like it was going out of style. Or even the candy that comes from, like, uh, I have a sister-in-law that lives in Sweden. Uh, the candy that she brings back is nice. Well, she can keep all the licorice stuff, but, like, the uh, the other stuff is just off the hook. They're using real ingredients in this stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, you're not going to find that. Go to an American grocery store where I was raised on, like, Jolly Ranchers and stuff. And, you know, I'll never eat one today. Because it's nothing but high fructose corn syrup. But over there, you can tell that they're using better. Even their cookies are not sick, sickening sweet. Or, you know, what some people call biscuits. But they're actually cookies to me. No, they're biscuits. I love them. <laughs> because they're not overly sweet. I don't like things that are overly sweet. And it's like you go in there, you buy things. They are usually cost much, much less than anything yeah. you're going to find here. And Better the quality, quality rice, too. All the way around. Yeah. I need to roll in there and see what their rice conditions are looking like. All right, y'all. Speaking of your condition, you got to keep it together. Until next time, stay alert. Stay alive. They don't want an individual just to carve a copy. You spitting that man a cottage. I'm talking saucy. All they want to build is a prison world.